being with you. Oh. Um, yes, yeah, I, I, I did ask if we could record it. Just this is just for my personal edification. <laughs> um, no, I do remember coming to see you uh, uh, all those years ago. And that was a great experience, and um, in fact, uh, the lecture is entirely about that project. Um, but I, I, I was sent a studio brief, which I've had a look at. And I, I think this should be very informative. I should mention there's a few of my colleagues from the office, just the other side of a door here, who have joined as well. Um, so they can wave um, over the internet. And um, I'm going to speak probably for 40, 45 minutes, and then very happy to answer any questions you might have. So the title I give in the lecture, uh, and this is this is a, a new lecture just for you, uh, it's Precinctual Planning. Um, and as Claudia pointed out, that's not a very often used word. Uh, and I haven't used it just because of its obscure uh, nature, but because it's, um, it's a way of uh, talking about, let's see, uh, first of all, Nicholas Pevsner, who used it. And I've broken the talk down into into four chapters, if you like. So Pevsner, Saville, uh, Gradle, and Ancaster. So they're all they're all names, and I suppose you see names fall together like that. Uh, it, it does. It reminds me certainly of the kinds of institutions that um, New College is part of, in that, that they're often parts of a campus named after different. Um, different people that were involved in the making of or the success of the institution. But anyway, Pevsner, in fact, is, is an architectural historian. Saville is the name of the road of the site. So I will say a bit about um, the context. Uh, Gradle is the name of the donor. So the person who uh, initiated the project and has in large part funded it. And Ancaster is the name of the stone that the the building is being mostly made of. So four chapters, Pevsner, Saville, Cradle, and Ancaster. And we'll kick off, first of all, with Pevsner. So um, this is a drawing by Raymond Unwin. It's an illustration of an imaginary irregular town uh, from Town Planning and Practice, an Introduction to the Art of Designing Cities and Suburbs, uh, London, 1919. And I suppose things to, to note are, it's imaginary. So this is an exercise in some kind of ideal idea of a place. Um, what's also therefore unusual is imaginary followed by irregular. So I don't know if this is true, but we can imagine it. That in the history of architecture, most imaginary things are not irregular. They're, they're highly ordered, they're highly symmetrical. When, well, when things of classicism or the Beaux-Arts, which was you know, prior to 1919, probably historically in recent uh, centuries, the most influential um, um, conception of architecture and the most widely taught uh, would certainly not have much interest in anything irregular. Uh, it would have been all around axes, symmetries, um, highly ordered city making. So Raymond Unwin uh, in 1919 is imagining an irregular town as an ideal. And I think this has something to do with the, the unit brief and your interest in going to Sardinia. And that is uh, seeing a, the pleasures, the, um, the successes of an apparently more naturalistic order, something that arrives from a set of conditions that have evolved over time. And Raymond Unwin uh, in the UK is is quite 
famed for this approach. Uh, 15 years before he did this drawing, he was asked by Henrietta Barnett to plan uh, Hampstead Garden Suburbs, which uh, some of you may know is a very famous example of a, a new extension to London that nonetheless was built on these principles of a kind of picturesque uh, attitude to planning. Um, but what was very interesting to me when I started to work in Oxford was this book um, written by Nicholas Pevsner. And um, so what was extraordinary about this book is that it was mostly written uh, in the 1940s uh, and it was in a manuscript that was never published and hidden um, in an archive in the Getty Center in Los Angeles. And Pevsner has been credited as one of the figures in the background who nonetheless was intellectually um, promoting these ideas of picturesque attitudes to urban design. And this book was found by a researcher uh, in um, the kind of beginning of this century and was only published about 10 years ago. So it's a book that kind of went um, missing uh, and probably in some of the intervening decades would have been considered quite um, unfashionable were it to have found the light of day. So um, it, it reappears now, uh, or reasonably now, and um, it, it's, a, it's an amazing read. It's quite polemical, and it makes the case for um, you know, what Pevsner says is, is, a, is a quite an English attitude to uh, planning um, towns, and he particularly looks at Oxford, uh, along picturesque lines. So he's, he's suggesting that the way in which gardens uh, were previously designed um, was could be a model for towns. And that would be uh, a picturesque model of uh, garden design would be to find very naturalistic relationships between parts that their the formal pleasure was in heightening their uh, closeness to natural forms or a kind of idealized version of nature. Um, and that maybe towns could be conceived, and I think he's, he's imagining now modernist buildings being inserted into historic fabric and the need for uh, a strategy for doing so. And again, you know, this would be in stark contrast to Beaux-Arts planning, uh, kind of French um, strategy of very hierarchical placemaking uh, that would require usually, you know, either virgin territory or large amounts of destruction um, to implement them. And he uh, illustrates his argument by walks through Oxford, uh, which he charts. Uh, so this is a walk, and I think it's, it's, I understand it's a little bit faint, but I don't know if you can see my cursor. Uh, there's New College. Yes, we do. Great, thank you. There's New College. Um, this is the city wall here, uh, Hollywell Street. And he does a walk, and he has a photographer uh, capture all of the views along these 12 points. And there's another, I think, maybe dozen walks. Um, and he uses this to illustrate his argument that every new intervention in Oxford was quite likely to have been wholly considered in terms of the context into which it was introduced. So here at the back, you can see, just poking up here, uh, that's Hawksmoor's 
uh, contribution to All, All Souls College, uh, an extraordinary Gothic double tower. Um, and obviously the, the photographers uh, adding his uh, license to this picturesque confection with um, uh, Hawksmoor's tower poking between the trees. And at the far end, you can see Gibbs, Roman Baroque dome, um, uh, and uh, a Gothic gable. And so as you progress along the 12 photographs, uh, his argument is that each of these new pieces of city that come into view um, have been placed in order to increase the picturesque uh, beauty of, of the context. Um, so here's Jackson's Bridge of Size. Uh, it's crossing the road at Hartford College and um, obviously recalling Venice. Um, and then there's the Bodleian on the left, the Clarendon building on the right, and Wren's Sheldonian in front, now under the bridge. Uh, and I think it's a very compelling argument, um, and, and certainly in the absence of anything else that would uh, suggest how do you go about inserting new things into such a rich historic fabric. And to the question of this word precinctual, um, it comes up in his book and the researcher who organizes for it to be completed and published in the 21st century um, feels that one of the original contributions um, to like design urban design theory that Pevsner makes is this idea of the precinctual. So, uh, and this is it explained diagrammatically. So there's the linear on the left, uh, things organized off an axis. There's the axial. So uh, things organized off uh, now a kind of branching system. There's the radial. Uh, so off a, a kind of point. Um, and then the grid, as it says on the tin. And then last, the kind of slightly more complex um, proposition, the precinctual. And this is his idea that you can plan a city around arrival and departure from courtyards, which makes a lot of sense when you think that Oxford is entirely made of, well, a large part of it is made of courtyards or quads, uh, as they're called in Oxford. They're called courts in Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge was established by academics, apparently not happy at Oxford many centuries ago uh, and started another university in a similar vein, but called it courts. Um, and well, what, are, what, what are all these quads about um they were built from the medieval period onwards primarily as a way of preventing this um so this is a postcard from 1907 of a riot on saint scholastica's day 1354 so this is uh, what town and gown meant in the middle ages which was um you know, students being massacred. Uh, maybe that massacres sounds sounds like probably larger numbers than there were. There was a lot of violence between uh, townsfolk and students, and that was because uh, education was a new uh, offer in Oxford. It wasn't regulated, um, and there were a lot of young men travelling from across the country to receive an education and arriving in a town that was ill prepared to host them, which caused a lot of tension. Um, and this was because these men, and they were, and they were all men uh, at that time, uh, were arriving in larger numbers and requiring all of these different uh, buildings and uses across the city, um, ranging from you know, somewhere to stay, somewhere to pray, somewhere to eat, somewhere to study. Um, and the 
there was a need to create a boundary between the space of education and the city. So uh, the cloister was a good precedent. And, you know, I like to think of this a bit like, you know, introducing a shopping center to an airport uh, in the late 20th century. It's like, you know, really pretty open-minded thinking. You have all these different uses. Why don't we make one building that has them all in? And so the first ever purpose-built and uh, well, designed and built in a single phase quad is at New College, uh, which is Great Quad, which is this, this image from 1403. And it's a building where a chapel is butted up against student residences, which is butted up against a library, a dining hall, offices. Uh, and I think when you first see these kinds of constructions, I guess they're, they're so singular in their material and stylistically, there's a fair degree of coherence. But actually, if you look at it typologically, they really are, it's quite an abrupt bringing together of different things. And, and, and what I see as being an incredibly bold um, bit of uh, type making. And uh, this becomes the model for creating different uh, institutions within Oxford for uh, teaching, uh, which are today the 30-odd colleges. Um, and this is the basis of the precinctual uh, organization of the city and also produces this... Um, I guess, extraordinary quality that one can move through passing uh, through the wall of one quad from one century into another and into another and into another as the largest college is in fact the one with the most quads rather than, so to go back to this, um, you can see they, they start to aggregate um, and this is a bit like Chinese courtyard houses. Um, you know, the Forbidden City is largest by dint of having the most courts, uh, not simply the largest singular court. I just thought I'd uh, show this, which is a Joshua Reynolds um, stained glass window in the chapel, which is incredibly beautiful and just one of uh, many artworks that have been incorporated into the the building over the centuries. Um, but the New College, um, it was called New, which, <laughs> which uh, is obviously very old and was new by dint of being about the third college. And I think it's the New College of St. Mary. So there's two other St. Mary's. Um, and it was built uh, straddling the city wall. And that has produced a strange event now that every year the city comes to uh, the college and inspects the wall uh, to make sure that 700 years on, they're still looking after it because it belongs to the city. Um, so they created a uh, front quad or great quad um, which was the image you've just seen. And you can see the, the tower that's part of it. And then there's also, to, also Cloister Court, um, which is where quite a few scenes from Harry Potter were filmed. Um, and it's, it is all quite Potter-esque. Um, and then this is the beginnings of this um, growth of the college. So in 1485, a uh, garden quad is added. And this is again, quite a radical departure. As you can see, it's um, two flanks of building that 
uh, create a, an open-sided urban structure that faces into a large garden and the city wall. And this coincided with um, the arrival of wealthy townsfolk uh, taking up uh, rooms within the college. So you could argue that the, the form of the original quad, which was to create an interior that was segregated from the exterior, uh, so to separate town from gown, has now evolved into a three-sided open embrace, which um, you know was a good metaphor uh, for the relationship of the college to the town, which was they were now encouraging uh, local people to take up residence and um, acquire an education. And here you can see a drawing of a great quad in the background and garden quad in the foreground with um, this beautiful gate uh, that gives on to the garden. Um, and here it is on a lovely sunny day. Um, and yeah, so I suppose there's this sense that at a very glacial pace, the, the type that is um, the quad is evolving to reflect uh, the politics of the day. Um, and I, I guess it, it raises the question which Stephen, I think, posed at the beginning, which is, there are these very ancient types and types of construction, but nonetheless, the the institutions are uh, continue, and you know they operate in the present day, and it raises questions of like how does one continue to evolve the type? Um, what is a contemporary quad? So, chapter two. Um, and I'm conscious I can go start galloping to keep keep up time because uh, we've done about 25 minutes. So, um, so Sable is the name of the road that the uh, site is on, uh, and this was a, a competition uh, that we won in 2015. So it'll complete next year. Uh, so it's been nine years, which is a lot more than half the length of the time we've been in practice. So it, it has gobbled up a lot of our attention. Um, and here you're seeing uh, the New College Historic Campus, at the bottom of the page. And then up to the north is uh, the uh, Savile Road Campus. Um, and I want to say a bit about how one, and, Again, thinking about your brief, can look at is it Regensburg? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. How yeah. does one look at something um, very ancient, uh, a Roman town, analyze it, uh, effectively make it one's own, um, in as much as it can be redeployed, but hopefully carry all the other conversations that'll be happening around the issues of the day, the climate crisis, different forms of association between people in contemporary society, et cetera. Um, so we, we started looking, uh, so the top left is, the, is a plan of the site. And we looked at all of the college quads, uh, trying to find uh, ones that were similar in uh, scale um, and what form could be added to the site. I, I should say that uh, I think some uh, there will be a slide later on. The site was mostly Victorian villas surrounded by gardens that were built at the end of the 19th century for uh, teaching staff to live in. And it's the last remaining significant bit of land that New College owns within the city. And it was an opportunity for them to try and find 
a hundred rooms for a hundred students, which would mean they could house all of their undergraduates on college owned land, which I think uh, not only do they provide very good accommodation, uh, as do all of the colleges, but it protects students. Um, there's a very there's a very short teaching term in Oxford and Cambridge, so eight, eight weeks, three times. It's very intense. I think if you're uh, renting property uh, on the edges of Oxford from a private landlord, I think there are probably a lot of not great experiences which can significantly affect your education. So the college is trying to ensure that the students have the time and the focus to concentrate on uh, their work in those eight weeks. And by providing everyone with a room, that's part of uh, the model. And um, we, we did start to imagine what an idealized quad would be in terms of the number of rooms, the hundred, um, in terms of what is the size of it? Is it multiple? And this became a, a kind of evolving template. And so here's, here's the site um, in axonometric. And you can see uh, one, two villas. Uh, this is a range of uh, against teachers' accommodation that was extended to have another wing. Um, this is also a kind of late Victorian early arts and crafts school that is also owned by New College. Uh, it's part of the same benefaction. So when New College was founded uh, by William of Wickham, he created New College School and uh, Winchester College, which is uh, a private, uh, it's called public schools in the UK. Um, so you could spend your entire life within a William of Wickham institution. And this school was created in order to provide, I think, a dozen um, young boys to sing for his soul. And I guess in the Middle Ages, uh, that was probably what preoccupied a lot of very wealthy people. Uh, William of Wickham was the second wealthiest uh, person in the country after the king. And I suppose it is remarkable to imagine a project from the late 14th century uh, trying to set up a legacy around your um, life that would persist for that length of time. Anyway, so that's the school. And we started to um, look at how that those idealized quads could fit into the site. And this building here that I'm pointing out, this is a grade two listed house. So one of the major considerations was that you could not build in front or to the west where there's a garden of this house. And that started to determine where you could insert a quad. And um, that was the brief. We would like a quad that is within the tradition of the type, but nonetheless contemporary. Um, and then thinking about this question of openness and the evolution from the closed to open quad, uh, we started to imagine it flexing in the site uh, to make this kind of double figure. Um, and then, you, so here you can begin to see the idea of there being two quads that protect the views of the listed house to the south, um, that take the precedent of the other quads, uh, filters it, ones that feel like they have some something to offer um, a kind of contemporary uh, feel of the institution. And this was about halfway through the competition stage. We'd um, managed to get to this point, which was a building that would grow out of the existing buildings that was uh, concerned to be uh, red as part of the existing roofscape because a lot of the late Victorian and arts and crafts buildings surrounding it are 
characterized by having very large eaves and the roofs are part of their facades. So that became uh, a kind of driving factor in this extension. And then um, I think, so chapter three, uh, Battle, is the name of the donor. Um, I think we were quite preoccupied with how to answer the briefs question of what is a contemporary quad if one's still trying to make something in the tradition of. And this is a sketch by Todd Longstuff Gowan, who was the landscape architect. And here, this idea about journeys, um, the routes through uh, the courtyards, um, you know, reading your brief uh, reminds me of this issue around um, urbanism that's very much about the journey from the most public to the most private. And here you can see Todd beginning to mark out uh, potential paths through, but then also that the building is beginning to um, kind of embrace those garden spaces. Um, and then these are some doodles from the time. And probably this is when it tipped from being um, something that was purely an interpretation of what we'd found um, into something that was the form. It's one of the small, the Gradle Quad, which is the curved one in the center, is one of the smallest in Oxford. And what we realized was that the smaller they get, the less quad-like they feel, but that if we could um, curve it and open it out, there would be a greater sense of interiority, which led to this, that um, the wings would be shaped such that the aspect of the quad would look past the listed building. It would create a greater sense of interior as you went into it, and that we would connect it uh, through to the other green spaces located around the site. And then that became this, um, yeah, I should, I gave you a wrong date earlier. So it was 1403, it was founded. I got that right. It's 1685 that Garden Quad was created. So um, this was at the same time that the Palace of Versailles, uh, its Cour d'Honneur, which was a three-sided court, was built, which was very fashionable. And there's an architect, uh, Bird, who had visited Versailles and brought this idea of a three-sided court, which again, you know, I mean, it seems um, not such a departure from a four-sided court, but it was radical in its time. And then we became interested in, if that's a kind of very slow journey towards changing the relationship between inside and outside, between institution and city, between uh, nature and the built, that we would um, introduce this uh, new form where there's almost an equivalence between the garden and built parts. And so this is the scheme as is being built now. And I suppose, I mean, I'm interested in the fact that most people, when they look at this building, think how very uh, self-referential it seems. The language seems to be all about something new that's introduced into the site. But um, there isn't a decision uh, in the plan or section that wasn't about um, the site that it's in. Uh, quite a lot of the geometry is determined by existing trees or the offsets from existing buildings or the desire to create courts um, for the school uh, and then a mirrored on the east for the um, the entrance uh, quad for the college. And there you can see the the uh, cranking of the arms such that the space um, takes advantage of the garden of the listed house to the west. Um, so in summary, the site began as villas with gardens and a school with playgrounds there was a building introduced in order to provide separation between the school and the college for the first time and to create three uh, quads and a new setting for the listed house. 
uh, and that this would be planted in a way um, that meant that the, the houses on the south, and this was a, a planning consideration that I won't go into, but that, that they should feel um, part of a green belt. And uh, thinking back to um, this idea of the precinctual and the journeys through uh, the city from courtyard to courtyard, uh, we were very interested in ensuring a kind of maximum maximum permeability so that from any court there were many routes and many journeys one could take and also that the um i mean think of your brief again it, it is a private site but we were keen that there was a view from the entrance to as deep into the campus as was achievable um so that the most private spaces were nonetheless available uh, to the passerby. And also then from an environmental point of view, that um, a lot of the rooms and the shared room space of the courts would benefit from um, South Sun. So the last um, chapter, Ancaster, uh, is about the stone which is obviously something you're, you're also uh, all very interested in. Um, so this is uh, a village in Lincolnshire, Ancaster, and there is a seam of rock there, a limestone, which is an oolitic limestone, and it has several beds. Uh, the most compressed is the hardest, getting uh, softer, as it, it reaches the surface. And um, at the competition stage, we proposed that there would be a geometric stone, kind of diamond pattern stone block that would uh, accentuate the curvature of the first curved quad in Oxford. Um, and this is the um, these are the planning renders. Uh, so this was done 2019 or so. Um, and you can begin to see from this view more easily the staging posts of a journey through the site from the, the, the Porter's Lodge past a new tower, a new accommodation building that replaced one of the uh, Victorian villas, and then the quad, West Quad, or uh, which Gradle Quad, which creates three south facing courts. And then the tower is a marker, um, the arrival at the Porter's Lodge, which frames, so you can see all the way to the, uh, the western edge of the main quad. Then here you're in the eastern quad, the entrance one, and you can see, so this is the existing building on the right. And actually, we cut away half of the um, historic building in order to create this new wing, partly because um, this existing building was all based on a staircase model of six rooms accessible only by staircase, and they're incredibly difficult to convert to um, um, disabled access uh, because you'd have to introduce a lift in every six rooms. So we had a new lift inserted on the right, which dealt with all the rooms that could meet it on the right, and then a new building on the left, which has um, step-free access everywhere. And then this is the the, the main um, quad, and then you can see the routes through to the different gardens. Um, and it was proposed to be made out of this limestone. Um, I mean, my particular relationship to stone buildings um, is that when I was a student, um, this was being built uh, in Cambridge by Hopkins. Uh, it was completed in 1995. I was living around the corner between 1991 and 94, and it was an exquisite building. Um, and uh, I think we had a site visit, uh, a curved stone building, um, which I think I returned to in my imagination. And also, uh, Stephen said, I worked um, with Adam Caruso and Peter Sinjin, um, and this was one of the last projects I did with them. 
uh, which is the Museum of Childhood, and the blocks here are Ancaster, uh, this kind of mottled blue and beige stone. So I had some experience of working with the stone and this, and also of working with um, load bearing stone walls. And by that, I mean that the blocks are deep enough that the wall uh, stands up on its own, but is restrained to a structure. Um, and so, I mean, we'll come on to this later, but you know, this is obviously in distinction to massive stone construction, uh, which is um, carrying the floors, which will be the buildings that you went to visit and perhaps more buildings in the near future. Uh, I, I dare say, if you if you do a good job and go on uh, um, with the idea of um, building stone buildings, maybe you will uh, build many more than our generation have. Um, so this is the first sketch uh, by uh, Price and Myers um, of a possible interlocking stone block that, um, so theirs was 150 thick, which is very thick, uh, and it would stack at the back and tile at the front. Um, and this was in the competition and it was slightly uh, inspired by lighthouses, which would traditionally have been stone and curved and had extreme weather conditions to deal with. So uh, this interlocking block uh, provided a very uh, strong kind of weather seal. Um, and I, I was interested in, and this, this is a Bridget Riley 1960s kind of op art drawing uh, I think called straight curve, um, and it speaks to this optical effect of straight lines on a curved surface um, having this, um, you know, kind of magnified um, curvature. Uh, so we, the stone was appropriate because it's a very similar color to a lot of the stone buildings in Oxford that are built of a stone that is no longer quarried. So if you wanted to make a contextual stone building, uh, that the honey colored stone um, is no longer available. And this was um, a stone, it's, it's from Lincolnshire, so it's not too far away, um, that is similar. It, it's really beautiful, uh, in part because of this blue mottling and the geology of this is that the stone was entirely blue at one point and the water gets in in fissures and it oxidizes the iron in the stone and turns it this um, kind of honey color but then where it doesn't reach remains blue um and so i i but this this uh characteristic is only in one of the three beds of the stone and it is not the bed that is typically used for architectural dressing so the upper beds are entirely uh this um beige color and they're much softer and that's much more commonly used in historic buildings um, the further down you get, the harder it gets, and the more there are these blue lenses. Um, and the weather bed, which is this, is much harder. Uh, it's therefore more durable, but it's much harder to work, which is why historically it was less favoured. Um, so I think this is quite fun. This is a 4D animation by the contractor. They did this just to pitch for the job. So... Um, I, I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, this is Sir Robert McAlpine. Um, it's slightly speeded up. Um, but we're really at the end of it. It's supposed to finish this summer, but it, it is dragging on, as they do. Um, but I, I think the last <laughs> few bits of this presentation are really about, um, you know, what it what it takes to make this. So every block of stone is cut using a digital model to achieve the right curvature. Um, 
you know, it was, um, we did reduce the number of radii uh, to a minimum, as I think four, to achieve the entire um, perimeter of the building. And I think the other thing to realize, is, so it's all 70 mil thick in the end. It doesn't um, interlock, but the blocks, even at that size uh, and depth, uh, require mechanical um, maneuvering from you know, the quarry onwards. And I think this video just gives you some sense of, you know, it's like a kind of lunar uh, construction site. Um, and there were numerous tests done. So here you can see how much blue is in the stone. And actually it turned out that uh, the donor didn't like that much blue. So then it had to be selected for a certain proportion of blue. <laughs> Um, I was really hoping we could build another building entirely out of blue stone, but that hasn't happened. Um, and then also all of the um, cornice line uh, was was precast in concrete, uh, color match the stone, just because I think the the cost uh, of delivering that piece uh, in stone, also the short um, blocks uh, was prohibitive. Um, so this question of, you know, how thick can one make stone uh, in buildings today? So this is 70 mil uh, thick, which is enough to stack a stone one on top of the other and for it to um, be able to take the load of the wall above it up multiple stories. Um, and I guess you would that would be uh, distinct from a lot of uh, open joint kind of tiled facades that are, you know, maybe those are kind of 1980s office buildings where it's just purely cosmetic, but it's not um, what uh, there's a British architect you probably know of, Amin Taha, who's done these incredible buildings where the stone's actually structural. Um, and at the time that we were doing it in 2015, that, I think that no one would have uh, listened to you if you said, I'm going to, I want to build a structural stone building. But amazingly, here we are. Uh, uh, now it's it's considered possible. Um, what you're seeing here in this detail is there is quite a lot of um, gymnastics to make a curved stone wall anchor to um, a concrete structure. And you're seeing the the, the stone reveals um, and all the clamps that are restraining. So it's not being held up by the structure, but it's being held back. And then, so here you can, you know, I mean, absolutely fantastic company grants of Shoreditch. Um, so you can begin to see this kind of optical effect of straight lines on a curved surface, heightening the apparent curvature um mm. and here this is the top of the tower um you know i'm glad they were doing it <laughs> it's very incredibly complicated so then to go to the the building up of the um the different elements the the concrete structure and then um we worked with bloomer layman who were, were quite brilliant as well uh, a swiss timber company that built the roof that we had imagined initially would be concrete. And then there are not enough suppliers that will do vaulted concrete roofs. Um, so uh, it was proposed to be made out of timber by the contractor because there was a larger pool of suppliers. But of course, it also then met um, a lot of aspirations environmentally about reducing embodied carbon. Just sad that that wasn't the reason that drove it. It was supply chain economics that did it. Um, but here you can see um, this kind of interesting moment where the concrete and timber, the whole top floor ended up being built out of timber. So um, an exquisite, uh, you know, they all come with huge big rubber mallets and knock it together. Um, and to create this roof, which was then covered with this kind of duffel jacket, um, and then um, has tessellated 
tiles and this is probably not so long ago now we're just striking the scaffolding um and yeah i'm just going to finish on a few slides of the stone um so the red stone is stone rays it's another british stone and then here you're seeing the ancaster and this was just a moment of just breathtaking craftsmanship where the the stone wraps around the corners of the tower. Uh, it's load bearing, 70 mil thick. Um, and they managed to, I guess, with a combination of the, the skills of the masons and also the use of um, CNC machining to, to create this kind of crispness in the geometry. And then here you can see one of the ends of the arms and then you can see this little frog there. There's a whole other story. Uh, Stephen mentioned artists, and uh, we worked with um, an artist, Monster Chetwind. She really is called Monster. Um, on um, uh, like 25 gargoyles, and this is the Golden Mole, which is an endangered African mole. Um, and so there's a theme of, you know, probably. 100 years, 120 years since the last um, period in which a lot of animals were on buildings, which would have been, I suppose, during uh, the expansion of European colonies, uh, the discovery of a lot of exotic animals, their representation on institutions in the UK as, uh, I guess, uh, symbolic of the kind of expansion uh, and um, I guess there's a certain idea about ownership as well of all of these uh, incredible natural world. But here we are probably at, at the other side of a cycle that's uh, all of those same forces have led to so, many, so much of the natural world struggling for survival. And given the building is intended to be there for over a hundred years, hopefully a few centuries more. There is this question about how many of these animals will still be around. Uh, and that was a story we thought that the building could tell, uh, particularly in its relationship to, uh, there's a, there's a, um, the, uh, natural history museum in Oxford is one of the buildings in the UK with the most, uh, uh, animal imagery from the 19th century. And then, of course, New College itself is covered with gargoyles, which are uh, often completely fantastical, um, the kinds of animals that no one who probably would have traveled much farther than the outskirts of Oxford would have seen, but was um, uh, conjured by their imaginations. Um, and then this is just uh, kind of visiting this journey, but now in real. Uh, still site huts and there you can see that view uh to the quad and that's the um you can see the stonework and also the light of um the arms of the quad uh, kind of falling across the roof there and then lastly the the view back from one of the rooms um through that gap to the tower and the gatehouse and i just wanted to finish on this, uh, which is the carbon cost of structural members in different materials, um, which Steve Webb shared with me, which was published, I think, in the Architects Journal in 2019, which is, um, you know, thinking about what you might be doing, uh, making stone buildings, and how it's really much more credible to make structural stones uh, buildings today. And this is the argument that there is significantly less embodied carbon in stone cut out the ground near to the site than in any other um, of the you know, equivalent structural materials. And at that point, it's over to you. Uh, so <laughs> thank you. I've already taken a bit longer than my 45 yeah, not, to 55 but yeah <laughs> not a problem thanks so much david 
Um, I just wanted to say a few things, which are a reaction to what you said, but partly a kind of message to to the audience. Um, I mean, it's a very special building, very specific, and I I, I know important to you apart from anything as a kind of investigation in form making as well as many other things um i what i get from the description 